the Vice Chancellor of the University of Peradeniya, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Director Postgraduate Institute of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences, Honorable uh, Professor Nyanananda, and members of the Mahasangha, and my dear friends. Let me first tell you how uh, elated and happy I am uh, to have been invited to uh, make this keynote address at a very important uh, session such as this, your uh, research congress inaugural session uh, of a uh, postgraduate institute that uh, delves into matters that are of utmost importance uh, to our country not just at this particular moment, but I think for a long time uh, these issues have been the reason or uh, the cause for uh, much of the strife in this country and uh, academic research uh, in these areas uh, would have, I think, contributed to lessen uh, those uh, polarizations that we have had for almost 100 years. Why do I say 100 years? Because the topic that's given to me is uh, about uh, constitutional reform, constitution making exercise from a northern perspective. And uh, if you look at it from a northern perspective, I think this whole exercise is uh, nearing uh, nearing a century and we still haven't uh, uh, resolved it. If I am to take our minds back uh, to the time this uh, whole exercise began, in the early uh, 1900s, the attempt at independence or at a at a, at a different status uh, to uh, this British colony was being explored. The Ceylon National Congress uh, pursued that. But it was in 1911, uh, uh, I think, that uh, Sir Ponopala Varuna Chalam started a separate movement called the Tamil League. Uh, so they have started uh, uh, a, a division uh, in the polity uh, of this island. Not that this island had been uh, always uh, one uh, single unit. It was only in 1833 uh, after the Colebrook Cameron uh, uh, reform proposals uh, that the uh, island was made one administrative unit for administrative convenience. Until 1933, it was administered as three different uh, units. Uh, as you in Kandy know, uh, Kandy uh, ceded to the British the last in 1815. Uh, and prior to that, the other two kingdoms had uh, at different times fallen to the different uh, uh, colonial conquerors, but after the British took over the whole island uh, in 1815, uh, it was decided by the by the British that uh, this island must be administered as one unit. I have often wondered how it would have been if they made a different decision. They could have made two different decisions. One, they could have decided to continue as three separate units. Or, they could have decided to annex the island of Ceylon as part of the empire in India. Both were quite plausible. If they decided to annex this island as part of India, and I say that because it was uh, the same uh, British company uh, 
uh, that had the interest in India at the, same, at, at, the, at the relevant time, the East India Company. And uh, if you look at the map uh, of India today, there are two sets of islands, Nicoba and Andaman Islands, which are far, far off the Indian coast than Sri Lanka is. But those two islands are part of India. Why? Because the British decided to rule those as part of India. But they decided to rule Ceylon as a separate entity. So this decision could have gone either that way or if there was no uh, Colebrook Cameron proposal, they could have continued as three separate units. So it's an accident of history or rather decision made in uh, St. James Court uh, that we became one uh, unit uh, in, in modern times. Be that as it may, in 1926, the idea of uh, constitution for Ceylon as it was being discussed, received a, a new uh, idea from the Oxford returnee SWRD Bandar Naika. He wrote six letters to the Ceylon Morning Leader, a newspaper then, arguing that the best model for Ceylon was federal arrangement. He was the first proponent of the federal idea publicly like that. Six letters and I have read all those six letters. In the last, I think the fifth letter, he even says that the, the model of federal arrangement must be that uh, which that is extent in in Switzerland. And as you know, Switzerland is actually a confederation. Uh, 26 cantons and uh, uh, is, I, I think, devolved mostly in Switzerland than any other, uh, any other federal uh, arrangement, perhaps USSR in the past. But uh, today, uh, uh, the most extent to which power is devolved in federal arrangement, it's itself. And SWRD Bandar Naika's suggestion was the Swiss model was the best model for Ceylon. He didn't stop with that. He didn't stop with writing six letters to the newspapers. He went to Jaffna and delivered a lecture, just as what I am doing today here in Kandy, coming from Jaffna. But he went to Jaffna and delivered a lecture promoting federalism. He tried to sell the idea of federalism to Jaffna in 1926, all in the same year. Of course, Jaffna was not ready to accept it. And in 1931 uh, elections to the State Council, the Jaffna Youth League, then presided over by uh, Mr. Andy Permanayadam, I think, called for Purna Swaraj. They said this reform is, we cannot accept this. Total independence for Ceylon. Total independence for Ceylon. Purna Swaraj. And boycotted the election. They boycotted the election to the extent that no one contested from Jaffna. No one even dared to contest that boycott and state council was left without a representative from Jaffa. So the federal idea of uh, SWRD Bandar Naika was roundly rejected by Jaffna in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, in, 19, uh, in, in 1931, in 1931, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, when the Donomo Commission came, the Kandyan chiefs made a representation 
for a federal constitution for Ceylon. That was repeated to the Solbury Commission uh, in the late 1940s as well. The Kandyan League then made written representations for a federal constitution for Ceylon. But in the 1940s, it is not only uh, the Kandyan wisdom that said federal idea it was the best uh, for this island, but the Ceylon Communist Party also passed a resolution in 1944 uh, arguing that Ceylon must have a federal constitution. That was the first political party. It is not the federal party that called for federal arrangement first in Ceylon. It was the Ceylon Communist Party in 1944, five years before the federal party was even born, uh, who passed a resolution for a federal constitution. And the Kenaman Vaitalingam proposals contain detailed suggestions as to how the uh, federal arrangement must be made. Around that time, the Tamil uh, demand was a very unrealistic and uh, even unfair one. Uh, Mr. G.G. Ponamalam uh, uh, King's Council called for balanced representation, 50-50 as it is known. It's not quite 50-50, it's balanced representation, but still, uh, from the benefit of hindsight, I'm able to say that that was an unfair and uh, an impractical uh, proposal that was made, which was not accepted. Perhaps due to that, that when uh, the Ceylon Independence Act, uh, sorry, Ceylon Independence uh, Ordering Council was uh, uh, adopted in Britain in 1947. By the way, our first constitution was not passed in Sri Lanka, as you may know. It was passed in Buckingham Palace. Uh, as much as the uh, decision to uh, keep this island as one unit was made in Britain. The first constitution that we got in for independence in Iran was passed in the British Parliament as an order in council. That was adopted, rejecting the federal idea where that came only from uh, Kandy. Uh, perhaps if the Tamil leaders at that time had asked for federal arrangement, it might have been granted. But that was not to be. And uh, uh, a simple uh, a constitution with simple majority rule uh, was brought into operation, uh, albeit with, the, uh, with one safeguard in section 29 uh, that limited the powers of parliament to make legislation. Either conferring on one community certain benefits or privileges that are not given to other communities or depriving a community uh, of certain privileges uh, that the other communities enjoy. Section 29 safeguard proved to be uh, totally ineffective because one of the first few legislation that were passed in independence in 1949 was the Citizenship Act. Why do I say it was ineffective because in the first parliament, 1947 parliament, there were seven members of parliament in a parliament of, uh, I'm not sure how many members there were, but less than 100, 90 or so. Seven members were from the upcountry uh, Tamil community, seven members. And uh, when the Citizenship Act was passed, all of them lost their citizenship including those seven members who were in party. So section 29 was uh, wholly ineffective because not just another privilege but the fundamental uh, feature uh, of a citizenship of a country was lost by a simple uh, act that was passed. Uh, and uh, 
it was then and then the following legislation called the uh, indo pakistan citizenship pact after the passage of those two it was then uh, that the federal party was born uh, on the 18th of december 1949 of which i am a member uh, today the itak is its official name but it has uh, always uh, carried the name the federal party even in official uh, election results you will see fp uh, is known as that's, a, that's actually a, uh, not its official name but it's always known as the federal party and in its uh, first uh, convention held in trichomani in 1951 april 1951 it passed a resolution calling for a federal arrangement federal party from 1956 onwards has won all the elections until today from the tamil speaking area so tamil areas earlier from tamil speak all tamil speaking areas but since the 1970s at least from all tamil areas so the democratic Uh, verdict of the Tamil people of this country since 1956 has been for a federal arrangement. Uh, <coughs> in between, there was a, a blip uh, in 1976 when the federal party, together with the All Ceylon Tamil Congress and the Ceylon Workers Congress, formed the Tamil United Liberation Front and called for a separate state. in 1976 and in 1977 general election there was a mandate granted from all tamil areas except one constituency kalkuda in the east which they lost by some 500 votes all other tamil areas the tulf won now i must uh, retrace go back again in time that after the federal party made its position clear in 1951 and contested and won the 1956 elections onwards it made pacts with several leaders of this country as you all know in 1957 itself with the same swr dibandar nayak 31 years later after he propounded the federal idea uh, the banda chelwa pact was signed and as you know uh, bandar nayak Uh, came out of his house in Gosmit Place and uh, <coughs> tore the pact and said, "I cannot implement it." I have met a uh, venerable uh, monk, uh, uh, a very senior uh, <coughs> member of the Buddhist clergy, who is uh, 85 years old this year. Who told me that he was one of those who sat outside <coughs> Vandar Naikar's residence in in Rosmit Place and demanded <coughs> that that pact be abrogated. He told me this about three or four years ago, and he told me, "I now realize what a big mistake I made as a young monk." Nevertheless, uh, that was abrogated, but Vandar Naikar himself was. Uh, Kill perhaps for uh, for making that pact and also agreeing to the reasonable use of time. The reasonable use of time. If one looks at Section 29 of the Solberry Constitution, at the time it was made, if they had asked, you know, give examples of the kind of legislation that are prohibited by Section 29. one could easily have said the official languages act you are conferring on one community a privilege that another community does not have expressly prohibited nevertheless that was passed no amount of legal challenges proved to be effective the federal party then made a pact with ratli selanayaka in uh, 1965 And he would join the national government of uh, Dutchy Senaika. Uh, Mr. M. Tirichelvam uh, Queen's Council became a minister through the Senate. But in three years, when Mr. Senaika said, "I cannot implement this pact," uh, Mr. Tirichelvam resigned, 
and the Sarva Party left the government. So two agreements made with two Prime Ministers of this country from two different political parties were unilaterally abrogated. Those two pacts did not provide for federal arrangement, by the way. They did not say federal, but the federal party was willing to compromise first on regional councils in 1957 and uh, in 1965 uh, with district councils. After those two failures came the 1970 general elections at which the United Front government received a mandate with the two-thirds majority in parliament and they started drafting a constitution, the Republican constitution for Sri Lanka, uh, an autochthonous constitution, meaning from the soil itself. Our neighbor India also got independence in 1947. And soon thereafter, they did not get a constitution from Britain, by the way. There was no constitution given by Britain to India. They were told to draft their own constitution. And August 1947 to January 1950, they drafted their own constitution. About two years or a little more than two years by a constituent assembly. Headed by the chairman of the constituent assembly was Dr. B. Ambayetka, the leader of the so-called untouchable community in India. So you see the difference. Who did they make chairman of the constituent assembly to draft the constitution for the independent India? The, the minority of minorities and untouchable was made the chairperson of the constituent assembly in India and in 1950 they adopted that constitution. It's a secular constitution. It provided for linguistic states. <coughs> the concept is that of linguistic states. So different language groups uh, became, uh, they were given autonomy. It's not called federal. Indian constitution doesn't describe itself as uh, either unitary or federal. It's called union. It's union of uh, India. And uh, 13, 13 languages were made official languages of India. One three. That was in 1950. And in 1965, I think when Singapore uh, bifurcated from uh, Malaysia, four languages, including Tamil, were made official languages of Singapore. But sandwiched between these two progressive measures, in 1956, we made Sinhala the only official language uh, of this country uh, and we didn't have to make four languages or 13 languages as official languages, we only had to make two languages. And in 1970 to 72 exercise was not one that reflected what happened in India uh, between 47 and 50. Uh, it was just one party that held sway. Not even the UNP supported the 1972 constitution. And the federal party put forward a few demands to the basic resolutions that were uh, put forward. Uh, so for the first time, Buddhism was given foremost place. So there was no equality of religions. For the first time, 1956 was an orderly legislation, but for the first time, Singhala was given the official languages, language status in the constitution itself. So there was no equality amongst the language groups that inhabited this island. And every one of the uh, amendments to the basic resolutions that were proposed by the federal party were defeated by a majority vote, 86 to 14. 85 to 13, 85 to 16, those were the votes at the Constituent Assembly. 
and uh, once all six resolutions were defeated, uh, Mr. S. J. V. Chalmanayagam uh, announced in the Constituent Assembly uh, that even the most basic demand, the last of the resolutions that they proposed was not federal, not even devolved powers to regions, it was to make Kacheris elected bodies. Kacheri is Mr. B. Dharmalingam who proposed that resolution said, if you can't make it federal, if you can't devolve powers to provinces or even uh, districts the way that we want, the United Front election manifesto says we will make Kacheri's elected bodies. Your own election manifesto says Kacheri's will become elected bodies. Do that. That was the last of the resolution. That was also defeated 86 to 40, you know, something like that. They defeated their own election mandate. And it was then that Mr. Chilvanayagam said, we have tried everything. I have made two pacts with two prime ministers that were unilaterally abrogated. We have participated in the constituent assembly and we have made very reasonable proposals, the last one of which is not even ours. It is your idea and you have refused it, so we will not participate in the deliberations of this constituent assembly anymore. And he also said, we will not walk out and make this a drama. From tomorrow, we will not come. That was how Federal Party left the constitution making process in the 1970s. And then Mr. Chalunayagam resigned his parliamentary seat and challenged the government to hold a by-election, which was delayed by two and a half years, and eventually in 1975, it was held and he won and his opponent was Professor C. Sundarlingam that Charita referred to, a colourful uh, figure then in Tamil politics, who was the first person in 1950s to have propounded the separate state idea. He wrote a small booklet, Ulam, spelt differently E-Y-L-O-M, uh, the beginnings of freedom struggle. He challenged, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Sundarlingam did not contest. Because we Ponamula from the Communist Party, Sundarlingam also challenged Samarayana previously, in 70, I think. Anyway, so that's how the separatist movement started. And in 1974, TUF was formed, and 76, TULF came, and uh, 77, uh, separate state mandate. Meaning that the Tamils of this country had not received their due place in the constitution making exercise of this country. That was the complaint. If by majority vote you dismiss everything, then this is where we will proceed. I have a story that a friend of mine says and I have said it many times. So pardon me if you have heard this before. There was a family of four children, fairly well to do. So school holidays, they decided that they must go on vacation. Every school holidays, they must go on vacation. There were three girls and one boy. The girls were interested in going to the uh, beaches. So they said, we must go to the beach. The boy was more interested in climbing rocks. He said, no, we must go up country. They couldn't resolve the conflict. So the parents said, we are a democratic family, let's take a vote. So naturally, they went to the beach. The sec next holidays came, and the same problem arose. The girls stood on their heads and said, we must go to the beach again. So being a very democratic family, they took a vote, and they went to the beach a second time also. When the third holidays came, the boy said, twice you have done it, and this time at least you must give, you know, we must. they said, no, no, we are a democratic family. <laughs> the majority will must prevail. The majority, majority rule is a bedrock of democracy. So we will go to the beach again. What does the boy do? He refuses to eat. That's the Satyagraha campaign. He refuses to eat. He says, I won't eat. Protests. But it happens over and over again. What does he do? He started, starts breaking you know, plates in the house. 
turns to violence. So that is what happened. All democratic effort was spurned, even pacts that were signed were unilaterally abrogated. And participation in the constitutional making constitution making <laughs> process in the constituent assembly, even with very reasonable demands, suggestions that came even from the other side were rejected. And so the Tamil community said, you have left us out of the national life of this country, then let us go our own way. That was the resolution that was adopted for a separate state. But of course, <clears throat> we have come a long way from that today. In 1987, an Indo-Lanka Accord was signed, a bilateral international treaty between two countries, which is still uh, effective and valid. Uh, that provided for provincial councils, and so we have provincial councils today. Uh, reasonable uh, extent of devolution of powers to all provinces. And you, it might interest you to know that in the present constitution making uh, exercise in the steering committee, by the way, I'm not a co chair of the steering committee, Prime Minister is the chair of the steering committee, uh, Dr. Jampal Ipramatna and I are co chairs of a management committee. Uh, that handles the secretariat. Uh, we invited all the chief ministers to come and make submissions. And the northern chief minister did not turn up. Uh, the eastern province chief minister did not turn up. But the other seven chief ministers and the leaders of opposition of those seven provincial councils turned up. Now, all those seven at that time were UPFA controlled. And all of them, all of them in their submissions, wanted the powers of the governors reduced. In fact, one of the chief ministers wanted the post of the governor abolished. He said, we don't want a governor. Um, all of them wanted police powers. All of them wanted land powers. These are the seven provinces other than the north and the east. It's all recorded. And in the interim report of the uh, uh, steering committee, the principles of devolution are set out and there is a note that says all of these are suggestions from the seven southern chief ministers and leaders of opposition. So in the present exercise, what is contained in the interim report with regard to devolution of powers are suggestions from the south, not from the north or from the east. Today we are in a position where after 2000 and in between, I mean you know the processes that happened, uh, 1993 there was a Mangala Muna Singh Select Committee proposals, between 95 and 2000 August <coughs> there were three uh, proposals including a, a constitution bill during President Chandrika Kumar Tunga's time and in July 2006 President Mahindra Rajapaksa appointed an APRC, All Party Representative Committee, and an expert committee to advise them. And at the inaugural meeting in July 2006, President Mahindra Rajapaksa made a speech in which he said there must be meaningful devolution. People in their own localities must control their destiny. These are his words, not mine. Uh, nevertheless, the APRC report has not been uh, implemented, neither has the uh, multi-ethnic expert committee report. So there has been a, a consensus with regard to the final outcome and uh, in 2015, January when there was a change of regime and later in August when the new parliament came, very soon thereafter a constitutional assembly was formed on the 9th of January 2016, consisting of all members of parliament and a steering committee with uh, a representation from all political parties in parliament. And we are, have been participating in those proceedings uh, responsibly because in 1989, uh, the Tamil political party publicly announced that we have abandoned the uh, call for a separate state. 
So within uh, a united, undivided, and indivisible country, we have suggested the word indivisible also. United, undivided, indivisible country, uh, we have asked for uh, a sharing of powers in such a way that majoritarianism will be will not be the order of the day. That other communities in this island also will have their due share of power <coughs> to the extent that they will be proud Sri Lankans as much as anybody else is. But for that to happen, there must be equality of status. A, a, a majority community that boasts of a majority of 70% or more need not fear that their status in the country will diminish. It's a substantial majority that cannot be tampered with easily. And the fact that they are a majority community must mean something and it will mean something in the affairs of the whole country where central legislature will retain to itself certain areas of governance, certain areas, competence over certain areas, crucial areas, like the country's defense, the economic outlook, foreign affairs, various other matters. But with regard to day-to-day -day affairs of the communities, the decision-making can be for Uva province, it can happen in Monrail or Badulda. Kalamud need not decide. It can happen in Jaffna or Vanni in the north. Kalamud need not decide. And devolution is not so much towards, you know, identifying separateness, but it is more power to the people at the periphery where they can themselves make decisions. So it is with that view that we have participated up to now in the constitution making uh, uh, process in a very constructive way uh, for which we have suffered greatly electorally uh, at the last uh, local government elections. Uh, most people on this part don't realize how much the TNA has suffered. In 2013 Northern Provincial Council election the TNA got 78.9% of the vote, near 80%. At the last local government elections, we have got 35% of the vote. The only reason is that we are participating in a constitution making process. Because our people uh, don't have faith. Uh, we have been uh, branded traitors and uh, fools, more than traitors, fools. Uh, they keep telling us, don't you know the history of this country from 1957 onwards? Even PACs have been abrogated, this will never happen. Uh, you are imagining uh, and you are sending us down the drain again. Uh, we participated uh, with the bona fide belief that, that something will come out and, uh, and that it must come. Uh, there is no redemption for this country unless this issue is settled and I, I will uh, repeat that. There is no redemption for this country unless there is an agreement between the, all the communities of this country. It must be acceptable to the Sinhalese, the Buddhists, it must be acceptable to the Tamils, the Hindus, it must be acceptable to the Muslim people. All the people like it was possible in India uh, more than 50 years ago. All the people of this country must agree as to what our constitution must be. It is not impossible to make that agreement. Because unless we all agree, that is a social contract upon which we can agree to live as one country. If that agreement is not there, then the country remaining as one entity is at serious peril. I'm not saying this to alert anybody or, you know, uh, threaten uh, separation, but I think what I'm saying is a reality 
and for all our sake, we must strive to achieve that consensus. And it's not difficult to achieve. If the southern provinces, the seven southern provinces have asked for something, and that be granted, we will gladly accept that today. That is how easy it is to achieve that consensus. But we are today, and I mean today and tomorrow, at crossroads, uh, wondering whether this whole exercise of the last two and a half years is about to collapse. Uh, unfortunate history of our country, uh, we thought ought not to be repeated, uh, but we'll wait till tomorrow to see what happens. Thank you.